there everyone, I'm Mr. Mocha Lover, and thank you for joining me here in Tiono, the last days of Europe, in which we're going to explore the Central Eurasian Republic. A pluralist republic formed from just about everyone in the region who opposed Daddy Tabby and lived to tell the tale. With Russia now consigned to history, something new is taking shape a nation where there will be no more hate, no more sectarianism, and no more bad dudes. All the peoples of Eurasia will coexist in peace, and no threat to the new society will be tolerated, my friends. <clears throat> And we, of course, are led by Mikhail Baganov, which has kind of a unique flag. But if you'd like to read about Mikhail Baganov, please go right ahead. But firm footing, Baganov and the soldiers he had brought with him set to the momentous task before them. <clears throat> After seizing an imperial arsenal, they brought dynamite to the governor's palace, not bothering to clean the corpses of the soldiers who had died defending this nightmare. Baganov surveyed the dynamite as it was placed, making sure to step over the pile of gore that had once been the governor. Ripped limb from limb, he remembered the screams the dude deserved worse, he thought. They all did. In a lapse of anger, he kicked the mangled head of the governor across the hallway. He calmed down immediately, looking around at soldiers, wondering what had happened, a swiftly returning to the work. He'd have to, tell, have to be calm, but how could he be calm? Here, in the swastika adorned heck, a double-headed eagle glaring down on him. <clears throat> As he was satisfied with the explosive placement, he shouted for the soldiers to leave once they had. They were met by a crowd of shivering, starving survivors waiting to see what was left of the palace, those parts they hadn't looted. Blown to kingdom come, do it, bagging up older, as a soldier pushed the plunger. An explosion rocked the palace, bringing part of it crashing down as pieces of marble and wood flew into the sky, but the main structure remained intact. He sighed. He'd watching as the dust settled on the husk of the palace. That darn palace, its blind eagle staring into a nightmare. Pickaxes, axes, and torches were distributed to the crowd once more, through though descending onto the palace. The palace still stood and must be torn down. The legacy of that madman, that arch traitor, that antichrist had to be destroyed. He and so many others swung, cut, and burned, trying to demolish the gilded symbol of Russia's end, tearing it down brick by sword of swastika and blazoned brick. Fall, darn you, fall, Baganov muttered as he tore a stairwell to pieces. What will it take to destroy you? What will it take to forget? Very cool. And with National Spirits, Benevolent Authoritarianism. Very awesome. 20% stability is very nice. And a very tasty earth. Mmm, yummy yum. But now we must have another event of the people's voice. Baganov pulled his old coat or coat closer to his body. It was cold even here in the former Army District Hedge. Headquarters that passed for his presidential office, which was one of the few buildings that had an independent power supply. With a breakdown of the power grid, only those buildings with generators could still provide heating. He didn't know how many had already frozen to death, but how many would had or would in the coming months. His mind snapped back into focus as he faced the three narrowed nicks. Mr. President, are you all right? One asked. Hmm, yes, I was just wondering, thinking of something. Please continue, Mr. Ivanov. The peasantry requires additional aid. With the destruction of Novosibirsk factories in the past decades, we Narodniks represent the common people of the Republic. You can go on about creating a Eurasian utopia all you want, but unless you can help the people you claim to support, your words mean nothing. Baganov grimaced. I assure you, sir, we are providing what we can. Supplies are low enough as it is, and we need everything we can, t we can to... Aren't you supposed to be helping the people? The ruddy-faced woman interrupted. Isn't that the point of your interim government, Mr. President? If you cannot promise us food and land, then give us democracy. Baganov stood up. I am doing everything I can. Do you know how many corpses I've seen? How many burned villages and desolated farms? The poisoned rivers? That's what being president means. And so long as our people are starving, so long as Daddy Tabby's remnants haunt the forest, none of us will be safe from death. That's a harsh truth. You want me to help the people? Then help me save them. We can have democracy in time, but for now, get in line or get out of the way. Oh, integrated military. Okay, secularism, illegal trade unions. Okay, very cool. Oh, we have uh, slavery outlawed. What? And open refugee programs. That hurts poverty. Oh, that's not good. The blight of Bono, Major Yevgeny Ustreyov, and his subordinate, Captain Kira Emikova. Stopped their horse-drawn cart outside Barnall, or at the least, the shanty town that had been built where Barnall once stood. The Imperial Army had used the original town for artillery practice, leaving only ruins for the survivors. Most died or fled, but gradually a settlement formed. The old Red Army combat engineer remembered his orders from Novosibirsk to try fixing the agricultural situation here. So, Captain Emikova, he asked as he dismounted the cart and fetched his supplies. How are you enjoying your first day as an army engineer? Funnily enough, not as grim as my civilian career, the younger woman replied. The company's better, you bathe more than those partisans. He chuckled, and the two made their way to the gates of Barnall, greeted by a party of farmers. 
The two made their way inside as a soldier escorts them, began distributing the rations they had brought as best as they could. Yevgeny began examining the irrigation structures of farmers who built as Kira examined the soil. Could be constructed better, he supposed, but it wasn't the main issue. He began taking notes as Kira approached. The water is contaminated, but not by much. Still, it's enough to make most agriculture here difficult. Yevgeny, check the map he brought and pointed west. The old warlord that used to be based here, oh, based, began working on a water treatment plant around three kilometers that way. Never completed, but we can salvage something and imp improvise a purifier for the farms here. Better than nothing, he slapped Kira's back as the two mounted the carts and began their salvage. To build the new, we use the old. Well, a few pollution regulations. Let's see. Academic base is doing very well, as well as equipment, industrial equipment, and agriculture. Research facilities have nothing, poverty is not doing any better, industrial expertise is slightly getting better, and nothing else to speak of. Except for, if you'd like to read about better industrial equipment, please go right ahead. Excellent! Rudimentary manufacturing lines, but the Titan Shadow. Yekaterina took a breath from her grim task in the streets of her old hometown, Novosibirsk. A Siberian winter and the collapse of agricultural supply had taken its toll in the city, and President Baganov had ordered the army to begin cleaning up the bodies of those who had succumbed. The homeless population was found slumped, frozen in alleys and in ruined shops. She then had to go to, into homes to find those who'd frozen to death in their own beds or take a more merciful way out first. God help her if the dogs had gone there first. As she drank from her battered flask of vodka, man, I could use some, she looked up at the ruined building in front of her. Above the doorway, she made out of the outline of three gears a similar... A familiar symbol, but one she could not place. She stood up and found a placard covering it in the snow. She picked it up, dusting off the snow, and made it out of a faded ward on the battered placard. Progress. She remembered it all at once. The Titan Corporation, the brains of the Federation, the nerve center of the Falcon's attempt to forge his new Russia. She scoffed in a past life. She'd been in Dobnik, one of those who kept the promise of a Russia that worked for all the people alive. Titan, Sabir, Phoenix, all their supporters. What did they know of the progress? What had their progress done for the people? But in spite of everything, she felt sorrow? Did she miss them? Yes, she concluded. They were dudes to a man, but they believed in progress in a strong Russia, in a land where, at the very least, slaves wouldn't be forced into back-breaking shifts for the glory of a dead princeling, or where she wouldn't have to throw frozen corpses onto pyres because they couldn't dig enough graves. She sighed and took another swig. Titan's progress had lost to the madness of what used to be Russia. She threw the placard to the sides as she returned to work. Regression. How disappointing. But that's okay. Because we still have Papa Mikhail here, keeping us nice and, well, somewhat satisfied with the current conditions, which, are, you know, could be better. But we do have Novosibirsk as our capital, but the Boneyard. What about Amur? Magadan? Or <clears throat> Arkhangelsk, said Dimitri? We could find help there. And we'll get shanked for horse meat in Amur, Magadan, or Arkhangelsk instead of in Novosibirsk, replied Vasily as he glanced askance at his brother. Sounds like a dream. Now shut up and help me. They've got to be a good plane here somewhere. The airplane graveyard outside Novosibirsk stretched around them. Most of them were old fighter planes from the war that their parents had fought against the Germans and were best, incapable of flying beyond either like Baikal or the Urals. They searched through plane after plane, careful to try and avoid those with the Imperial Eagle and Swastika upon them. They had seen those fly over the skies countless times bearing gas bombs, oh gas, to some unfortunate village. Even if they were sure they wouldn't trigger the chemicals inside, those planes were only capable of slightly longer flights than the fighters. They were made for terror, not travel. But almost a full day of searching, salvaging, praying, revealed the horrible truth. Those cursed engines of death were the best they had. Vasily looked up at a map piece sat against the wing of a Yak-9. Once we fix this rusty can, we'll fly to Ar Irkutsk for some resupply. Then Chumakan. And after that, we either ditch the plane and head to the Sakhalins by boat. Or ditch the plane in Petropavlovsk and leave for Alaska. Vasily, I'm not sure we... I don't care, Dmitri. It's better than nothing. Stunned in his silence and ashamed at his outburst, he helped his brother fuel the plane. Wings of death carry us to safety, my friends. But... That is the end of the events for the Central Eurasian Republic. If you enjoyed it, leave a like. Subscribe if you're new. Check out my Discord link in the description below, and I'll see you tomorrow in another video. Thanks for watching. Have a great rest of your day.